welcome to the, uh, the State Playhouse at Cal State LA. I'm Bill Covino, I'm the president of Cal State LA, and I am delighted uh, to have you here for our panel uh, discussion uh, and book signing with George Plah and David Aon, the authors of Power Shift, How Latinos in California Transform Politics in the Nation. Uh, we're very fortunate to have us uh, have with us here tonight several of the, the uh, pioneering elected officials uh, that are profiled in this uh, wonderfully engaging and insightful and I think transformative book. Uh, it's extremely fitting that we're hosting this event here at Cal State LA. Uh, George, along with four of the ten Latino-Latina leaders featured in Powership, uh, is himself a distinguished alum of Cal State LA. Uh, other alums that you'll be hearing from uh, are uh, former Los Angeles Council Member and Assembly Member Richard Alatore, who's with us tonight, former Assembly Member Los Angeles Council Member and LA County Supervisor Gloria Molina was also with us tonight. Former Congressman Esteban Torres, former Speaker of the Assembly, Los Angeles Council Member and Mayor of Los Angeles Antonio Villaraigosa, all alums of Cal State LA and some of whom are with us tonight. We're very proud of all that they've done and all that they continue to do uh, to move our community and the region forward. And we're also very proud to have with us tonight two men whose careers as organizers and elected officials have embodied uh, Cal State LA's mission of engagement, service, and the public good. Uh, two leaders who are champions for our community and champions for Cal State LA, Los Angeles Council Member Gil Cedillo and former Assembly Member and California Senate Majority Leader Richard Polanco. With that exciting and, uh, and distinguished group uh, before us, uh, we, we take notice of and celebrate the monumental struggle for social justice and political representation that's documented in PowerShift, uh, which began in the communities that are served by Cal State LA, Boyle Heights and East Los Angeles. This was a struggle that, as many of you know, involved community organizing, coalition building, and, uh, and political prowess. It was a struggle that changed the political landscape in Los Angeles, in California, and in the United States. Our panel will be moderated by Dr. Rafe Sunshine, the executive director for the Pat Brown Institute for Public Policy at Cal State LA. He and our distinguished panelists will discuss the lessons learned from a fight for justice and equity that spanned more than a half century and, in many ways, still continues today. They will draw parallels between the past and the present. They'll offer insight and lessons for future leaders, uh, including uh, many of the Cal State LA students who are here with us tonight. And afterwards, please join us for a book signing and a reception. We're just delighted that all of you are here for what promises to be a wonderful evening. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rafe Sonnicha. Uh, good evening, everybody. Everybody okay? Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you, President Pavino, and thank you for your leadership in proving that we are L.A. here at Cal State L.A. And we're all very proud to be part of the university and to follow the President's lead in engagement, service, and the public good. Welcome to all of you this evening, and especially we welcome back our honored guests in public service, impactful representatives, each of whom has a close connection to this university and to the communities we serve. From Boyle Heights to East LA and beyond, they have shaped and reshaped this world to help communities become empowered, and in the process have changed California and the nation, for which we acknowledge and thank you. They have taken the great risk to jump into the political arena. Don't underestimate that risk.
to overcome barriers, to make change, to pass and implement laws, often in alliance, at other times even in conflict with each other. Managing the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that are the wages of true public service. Please join me in celebrating and saluting their commitment. We celebrate tonight the release of a timely book, timely because the issues that these leaders have and are grappling with today are never far from the front burner and profoundly affect the lives of our students, their families, and their friends. This is living history, literally. Our mission tonight is to link the histories of these individuals, the Latino and Latina rise to power and prominence in California, and the hopes and dreams of today's young people. How many students are in the room today? Would you raise your hands? Let's acknowledge our students tonight. <laughs> we want this to be a conversation. And in that spirit, I propose that we, with the greatest respect, be on a first name basis this evening. My name is Ray by the way. Um, as to the leaders on the stage, you'd be unwise to address them this way at work, uh, where it would be seen as disrespectful. But here at home, we remember that the greatest tribute to an elected official and leader is to be known in the community by their first and familiar first name. That means everybody knows them and has a connection to them, as we will this evening. We want to use our time well to inform and to engage. And I've encouraged our panelists to engage with each other. We're not going to have a set of individual press conferences, so match us some questions that will get us all thinking and perhaps speaking with each other. And to engage with you. We have speaker cards throughout the, uh, question cards, not speaker cards, throughout the Playhouse. We will collect them throughout the evening. Would you raise your hand if you're collecting cards. There are, see them all around here. People are collecting your cards. After our panel discussion ends, we will present some of those questions to the panelists for their discussion. And now to begin, it's my pleasure to present to you one of the co-authors of Power Shift, my friend and colleague, Professor David Ione, who in the spirit of the evening is now just David. You'll be David the rest of the evening. Thanks, Ray. Well said. getting around to the applause. <laughs> David Ione is a senior strategist and advisor at Latino Decisions and a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University. He served as a senior advisor to the Mexico Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. His work has appeared in numerous published academic and popular uh, journals and newspapers and books. Uh, he's taught courses on politics and U.S.-Latin American relations. Uh, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a director of the U.S.-Mexico Foundation. But more directly, he's well known as a voice in Southern California. He speaks widely and eloquently on the issues that we're here to discuss this evening. He participated in the presentation of the Pat Brown Institute's Latino poll several years ago, where he spoke very eloquently. Um, we're very proud of him and George for producing this marvelous book. And I know how long this went, how many years went into the preparation of this. So we're just happy to be a part of it. With no further ado, let me introduce David. Thanks very much, Raven. Thank everyone here. Uh, for, for coming on a, on a rainy afternoon, uh, is what I'm told. I'm going to set my timer since um, I understand that I have exactly eight minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's great to see you and, and, and it's great to be here, at this, in particular here. And I would most of all want to direct uh, just a few thoughts about the book, about this experience, about these leaders uh, to the students and to anyone, actually, who is interested at all, really, in either politics or uh, the Latino community and the Latino experience. And one of the things to, uh, to have in mind 
is that we went back and forth, George and I and others, because we, uh, we consulted with a lot of people and, of course, obviously uh, interviewed and, and conversed and, um, and did a lot of research with, with a lot of people and a lot of resources on this, as to whether we would put into the subtitle that this is about the invention of Latino politics. And we kind of like that, but we got a lot of pushback saying, well, you know, they're going to hate you in Texas and <laughs> in Chicago and in New York and in Miami if you claim that Latino leaders in Southern California, on the greater east side, uh, in urban Southern California, <clears throat> invented Latino politics. But I think there's really an important sense in which that is true. It didn't exist when they started out. There was no Latino politics. In all, practically halfway through uh, the 20th century, there was still not a single Latina or Latino elected official in the entire state of California. Um, Edward Hall was the first uh, in 1949 uh, when he was elected to the LA City Council. So they had to uh, learn by doing. They had to make it up as they, as they went along. Um, there's a great phrase in Spanish about uh, uh, se hace camino caminando, right? You, you make the road yourself by walking, by moving forward. And the important thing about the place, including this very place, uh, this campus, is that this happened in what I like to call the, the urban crucible of greater Los Angeles and especially the greater the greater east side, because that's something that a lot of people who are not familiar with the Latino experience or the Latino uh, community and population, uh, a lot of people still have not grasped that, that Latinos have been an, a predominantly urban population and community for almost a lifetime already, since at least, I believe, 1960, uh, and probably before that. And it's really, we're talking about an overwhelmingly urban population, and it's in this setting you know, what However important other settings were, and there were lots of fights and struggles and leadership that emerged from struggles in the countryside, of course, in the fields and in the mines and working on the railroads. But modern Latino politics, as, as we know it, is really uh, something that developed in an urban setting, and that's really important, and, and the book gets into that, um, in case you're interested in, in urban questions as, as we are. Um, three uh, quick observations or takeaways that I would uh, suggest uh, based upon the experience of all of the ten principal figures in the book, um, as well as many others that appear in the book, but, uh, but they don't get billed as, as principal figures. And that is um, what's involved in the empowerment experience. How, did, how does this work? How did it work? How did it happen? And I'll just offer three. There's many, many other things that you can uh, take from this. Uh, three points. One uh, that everybody, certainly the students here are involved in, is learning. And by that I mean specifically political learning. And I'll expand just a little bit on that very briefly. Learning, leadership development, and I'll expand on that too because it's not uh, obvious what that means. And thirdly, resilience. Um, essential, essential ingredients, I think, in the process, the experience of the invention of Latina Latino politics um, and the empowerment of the Latino Latino Latina Latino community. With regard to learning, political learning, there's so much to be learned. And there's something that I would communicate and throw, throw right out there to, uh, to counter uh, people who have different views and, and, and in many ways uh, quite legitimate views. There's this notion that um, you could have citizen legislators run the government, people with no experience, that uh, have no professional skills that are involved in political leadership, um, that, uh, and that certainly don't consider this as something that they would pursue uh, as a career or for a lifetime, or just one of, of several careers. I, I, I think that's just uh, simply wrong. There are so many uh, professional political skills that are involved, and not just on the part of those that wind up running for office and being elected officials and serving as legislators 
um, or as in, in executive positions or, or, or in another governmental position. You, of course, there's a lot of learning that's involved with regard to how elections work and how, and how you can win elections. Um, there's so much uh, involved in learning how to make policy, how to legislate, how to lead in different uh, contexts. There's so much involved in governing and the oversight. And here again, I would like to emphasize that we're not only talking about the elected officials. There's so many roles that people have to play um, in this whole process, in the process of politics and government, and in the process of empowering a, a long, marginalized, and disempowered community. Um, uh, and one of the implications of knowing that there's a learning process involved is the need to accept experimentation for purposes of innovation. And when you experiment, it'll bring me to the third point, which is resilience. You have to be prepared uh, to fail. Failure is, is uh, an essential part of the learning process itself, and of course, uh, for exercising leadership. Very quickly, on, on leadership development, I would just emphasize again, what we're talking about here is not just the candidates. Um, we're talking about developing uh, leaders who will run for office, who will serve in office, who will uh, uh, play a number of different roles in politics and in governing and in connecting those things to communities. Uh, but it's also the development of activists and it's the development of networks. So I would say already on these two counts, those of you who are students who are interested in this, clearly you're involved in learning. And even just coming here and talking about it, you're involved in the development of networks that are absolutely key. Without those networks, uh, empowerment just doesn't happen. And let me just end on the point about resilience. Quickly on the record, Edward Roybal, um, Richard Alatorre, Esteban Torres, Richard Polanco, all lost their first race and then had to run again for the same office. Uh, that took resilience. There was a lot of learning, there was a lot of leadership development, but most of all, there was great resilience. And I've run out of time. Thank you. <laughs>
in 2017. He has served in the State Assembly and the State Senate. And one of the wages of success is that he is most known for his most famous, hardest worn, longest tried attempt uh, that many of you have heard of to grant driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants that was finally signed into law in October of 2013. I think you could join us. that is, it just always makes me feel like I don't like all of his other achievements to be not recognized. Uh, numerous work at the state legislative level and also in the city of Los Angeles uh, where he's taken the to lead to create the LA Justice Fund uh, to assist people in immigration proceedings and as you know people are not granted the right to attorneys in many cases and it's been important for state and local government to fill that gap. Uh, he's also worked with the police department to strengthen Special Order 40, and he's been quite a leader in that. He grew up in the Boyle Heights area of LA and attended Roosevelt High School, uh, graduated from UCLA in sociology and received a law degree from the People's College of Law in 1983, and had a long career as a leader in the SEIU, um, Local 99. 660. Six, sorry, wrong local. LA County's largest overall union where he served as general manager and welcome to Council Member Sadiq. <laughs> Gloria Molina has, has made a career of being the first. Uh, I think maybe is, has the first of firsts uh, among people in Southern California. Uh, she has played the role as a former member of the County Board of Supervisors, as a member of the State Assembly, and as a member of the LA City Council. In all three of those cases, she was the first Latina elected to those offices. So a pathbreaker in three consecutive uh, She's also been nationally recognized by Time Magazine. Uh, she was listed as a possible vice presidential candidate in the 2000 presidential election, uh, was known in the First district and among the county supervisors is a fiscal watchdog, uh, careful with the taxpayers' dollars, um, and has made history really in all these cases because in some cases what was required for her to get those seats was basically a lawsuit that the entire civil rights community took charge of to create even the possibility of her being able to run. It tells you a lot about the history of the time. She began to be a community activist while still in college. Um, helped establish the Chicana Action Service Center, and there are numerous issues on the east side that are of historic importance that Gloria played a major role in. So welcome, Thank Gloria you. Molina. <laughs> Richard Alatori uh, has served in the California State Assembly and the Los Angeles City Council, but both of those, I think those are an understatement uh, in terms of the role that he played in both of those bodies. In 1985, he became only the second Latino to serve on the LA City Council. There had been a gap between 1962 and 1985 uh, when Ed Roybal left to go to Congress. Um, he replaced the council member Arthur Snyder, which we could talk about another time, uh, and was a strong ally of Mayor Tom Bradley uh, in the years that Tom Bradley was um, recognized as the coalition progressive leader of the city. Uh, previously, though, he had a very distinguished career in the State Assembly, 12 years, uh, played a major role in elections and reapportionment, uh, was the guide of the 1981 and 82 reapportionment process that opened the doors for many Latino candidates, Latino and Latina candidates, to run for the state legislature. And don't forget, he also was the main author of the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act, which Governor Jerry Brown has described as the greatest achievement of his first uh, governorship. I think many people would agree with that. Um, he was born and raised in East Los Angeles, uh, began running for student council, I guess, what, when you were in middle school? <laughs> sort of had the bug. Attended Garfield High School, uh, got his BA from Cal State LA and a master's degree in public administration from University of Southern California. I met Richard when I was executive director of the City Charter Commission, and my first stop was to go to each council office and chat with each council member. 
you and I sat with Hillary Norton, and basically Richard took a lot longer than the other people to basically tell me what's what. And I had a pad with me, and I took down notes. And it later turned out that just about everything he told me about City Hall turned out to be true. So I never got to say thank you for that, Richard. So welcome to Richard Alex. I'd like to introduce Richard Polanco, who's on his way. That way we'll be able to keep our conversation going, and he'll just jump right in and, and join the flow. Also from East Los Angeles, graduated from Garfield High School, where he was senior class president, former majority leader of the California State Senate, and also a member of the Assembly. Very well known for his work in increasing the representation of Latinos and Latinas in the state legislature. Took that on as a major lifelong project and had a very large impact. Uh, most of his districts, as they vary, covered almost this entire region that we are in. Uh, he authored legislation in after school and summer school programs uh, and has founded numerous uh, programs and nonprofit organizations in the community. Uh, at one point, he was special assistant to Governor Jerry Brown and chief of staff to Richard Alatori. So, welcome, Richard Polanco. Until he's here, let's clap. Him. <laughs> and now, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions I'd like to throw out here. And again, I'd like you to feel free to to jump in as you as you feel appropriate. David talked about two things that I'm really struck by, learning and resilience. And I think in each of your careers, those things, I would like as a professor to believe that all important learning only happens within the doors of the university. <laughs> That's probably not true. And I'd like to know first off, where did you learn your first and most important lessons that were gonna guide you through public service? From whom and in what setting? And what kind of difference did they make to you going forward that you could see in your work? Okay. Uh, well, the, probably the most important person in my life uh, and I can go back being born and everything else, my father. My father was a man that worked for 35 years for a stove manufacturing company not too far from here. Uh, on Olympic Boulevard, O'Keefe and Merritt, a man that uh, had never graduated from, from high school, but probably one of the most profound individuals I ever had the great fortune of meeting, and obviously him being my father. And uh, he taught me most of the things that I learned uh, growing up uh, he taught me about resilience, talked to me about the importance of uh, getting an education. And, you know, to his last day, uh, it's interesting because my son, uh, that is here somewhere in the audience, uh, was born that morning. And right after my son was born, uh, I went to see my father because he wasn't feeling well and, you know, talked to me about number one issue in his mind and that was uh, getting education. And he ingrained that in me. Uh, there was never a, a time when I thought that I would do anything else because I wasn't very good at anything else. And I wasn't good with my hands like my father was. Uh, but he taught me a lot of things and uh, very fortunate to uh, have had him for as long as I, I did. Uh, my father died the same day that my son was born. Uh, and, you know, I grew up in not too far from here, a mile or two from here. Uh, went to all of the local schools. Still body president in junior high school, still body president in, uh, in high school. And uh, then I came to Cal State LA. And it was probably one of the most eye awakening experiences I ever had. And I would comment to a couple of friends that I had here uh, 
uh, at Cal State LA about the fact that I never, you know, maybe at a week period, maybe I'd see 10 Chicanos on the campus walking either to class or walking from class. And uh, there was never a doubt that I wasn't going to graduate from, from college, uh, even though, you know, I had a lot of challenges like so many of us that uh, grew up in this community and other communities, uh, not given uh, what maybe others have received, uh, but my father taught me resilience. He taught me uh, the importance of certain things. Uh, your word is a man. Uh, taught me about the importance of friendship. He taught me uh, the importance of knowing, you know, what to do depending on situations. He taught me the importance of uh, being uh, in public service and, you know, giving back for that that you have been given. Uh, took me to the first political function that I ever went to. I was a uh, student body president at Garfield High School and Jack Kennedy came to East Los Angeles, to East Los Angeles College. And he probably, and the Kennedys had an amazing uh, amount of influence in legitimizing to me what I think I knew early on and that was the importance of giving back to a community that uh, you were fortunate to live in. And the school gave me the opportunity to take the first step and from there I had the opportunity of uh, you know, having another kid, and my another son, and uh, deciding on what I was going to do. And uh, I did it, and uh, I decided that, you know, from the experience that I got with uh, the presidential campaign, uh, that one day I felt that I would love to represent uh, the community that I grew up in. And I was fortunate enough to uh, have the experience uh, with doing other things, teaching at the University of California at Irvine, working on uh, the walkouts that were taking place by young people that uh, decided that they had enough and embarrassing their families, their parents, into supporting uh, the efforts that they were attempting. That was strictly uh, to improve the educational opportunities for young people that grew up here uh, in East Los Angeles. And, you know, from there, I taught, I learned a lot from that experience that ultimately took me to my first uh, run for public life, uh, and I lost. Very humbling experience uh, to lose. Uh, but, you know, I learned from my father that, it, you know, you don't always win, but it's important what you're going to do as a result of that and how it makes you a better person from it. And I kept that in mind and was able to get elected and served uh, two legislative bodies and had probably one of the greatest experiences I ever had in being able to finally, after about 12 years in office, to represent my mother, uh, who lived where I grew up. In. Uh, she pretty much lived there the rest of her life. Uh, and that was the greatest day in, in my life. And my kids uh, taught me a lot, and uh, public life obviously became very important to me. And well, can I can I move on? Thank you very much, Richard. I think you actually answered two questions.
Gil, I have a question for you. How many times did you propose the driver's license? <laughs> I have a reason for it. You've got a nickname for it. Yes. Uh, it was a 20-year venture. Uh, the responsibilities and privileges of driving legally in this country were taken away in 1994. Uh, so during that Prop 187 era. Uh, I was at the union then. We obviously were opposed to, to that. When I got to the legislature in 98, uh, Nativo Lopez, the head of Hermandad Mexicana, and Bert Corona brought this great idea to me that we should restore these privileges. Uh, I was pretty naive about the process and the kind of political climate, so I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. Why don't we just uh, do that? Uh, so I introduced it immediately. It was a commitment for my campaign. I think there were nine introductions, maybe, over the 15-year period. Uh, Beatles, an abundance, uh, particularly in the entire uh, era of Schwarzenegger. And then we continued to work on it. I had to leave the legislature um, after 15 years, and I handed it off to a colleague of mine, Luis, and he was going to introduce it uh, the next year. And, I had worked with Jerry Brown, we had an understanding of how this was going to happen, and uh, to his word, Jerry Brown did ultimately sign it. But it was a 20-year experience. Uh, well, I have a question for you. Yes. Who among us could have done that and had so much frustration for so long and stuck? Where did you learn, where did your learning come from that gave you the sense that you would just keep at it all the way until it was successful? Well, I think there's, like uh, Richard indicated, our families play a big role. Uh, we come from humble backgrounds. I come from a very humble uh, family and background. Uh, my family comes from Barstow, California. My father's side moved north from Durango. Uh, so really challenging environments to, to begin with. Uh, last year, I had the privilege of going back to Tawalilo, uh, Durango, to see where my father's family came from. And, you know, these are tough environments, tough. Then you go to Barstow, and then you're like, oh my god, I'm so glad my dad came to Los Angeles, right? Because <laughs> I am not. <laughs> well, that's Barstow. And, but th thankfully, my dad came to Los Angeles. He was 11 years old, and, and uh, he came to L.A. about 1941 on his own. Took, got a job over in uh, the Roosevelt Hotel, over at the Crown's Chinese, worked at a Chinese restaurant. Here's a young man, you know, sometimes you'll see in a restaurant a young person in the back working, right? And you're wondering, well, who's, who's the parent? Who's taking care of this kid, right? And then my father was in L.A. with his friend, worked at American Can Company as a teenager. So I think you learn that by, by the resilience you learn by watching it as you grow up. Uh, the other institution where I learned from was the sports, the Pop Warner program in East L.A. To be very honest with you, my coaches have played a major role in my life. Uh, they help me to set goal setting, uh, teamwork, uh, they give you courage, uh, and give us experiences that went beyond Boyle Heights, and went beyond East L.A. and took us throughout the entire county. And so you begin to see uh, a lot of the world, at least for us as a 13-year-old, uh, we went to the championship game. There's a lot of drama and excitement when you're that young to go beyond uh, Boyle Heights. And so I learned so much, I give a lot of credit to my coaches, Richard Angel, Al Chavez, a lot of these legendary guys. And so uh, I, I think I've learned from that. Uh, my son's here and I, um, I was very fortunate to meet my wife when I was young and she was very courageous. Uh, she passed from uh, cancer. Uh, but her life in terms of meeting those challenges of, of that or an inspiration, and so uh, I made a commitment to her uh, before she passed away that I would get this done. Uh, if you knew her, actually I met Supervisor Molina was her teacher, <laughs> and that's the first time I met the supervisor in 19... Many years ago. Many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you knew my wife, I made a commitment to her, and uh, I was not going to not fulfill that, and so... Uh, you know, we live in an era where sometimes people give each other hostile nicknames to make them seem yes. less than they are. Yes. And a great skill is to turn a hostile nickname into a positive, positive. nickname. 
And at a certain point, a million people signed up under your driver's license. So do, you mind, do you mind sharing how your initial nickname became a different nickname? <laughs> There's uh, some, what do they call them, purveyors of hate on AM radio. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were, you know, so obviously we, we struggle in America today both with, you know, people, I mean, fake news is now currency, but it was new then, and there were these pioneers in the uh, purveyors of hate and fake news, and so they would call me One Bill Gill. One Bill Gill. And, uh, you know, forget that a hundred bills have my name on them that are now law, signed by four governors, it's in the bio, Governor Wilson, uh, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Davis, Governor Brown, so there's a lot of bills besides the, the driver's license bill. But they wanted to, to you know, diminish right. uh, this effort, and so they called me One Bill Gill. And, uh, you know, we, we struggled with that. Uh, and initially, we didn't quite understand how to handle this, and so we were on a lot of uh, these hate talk shows of both radio and television. Um, what's the guy with the bow tie, right? <laughs> uh, Tucker Carlson. Yeah, Tucker Carlson, he called me the most arrogant politician ever met. We were on with uh, uh, Joe Scarborough, we were on with Lou Dobbs, I mean, we were, you know, we were the, the, the punching bag, uh, if you will, during that time period as one Bill Gill. But we turned that around, and, and as you said, over a million people have signed up, and uh, there's 1.2 million new immigrant motorists on the highways who are driving less polluting vehicles, who are insured, who are more responsible, uh, and our highways are safer. I say that, not only do I say that, but there is a really uh, landmark study by Stanford that lays out uh, the benefits of, uh, of this legislation. Now, now all of a sudden, uh, everybody thinks it's uh, the best thing we could do. So yeah. and, the, and the name change? The name is One Bill Gill. One Bill Gill. <laughs> On resilience, I think it's really an important part of who we are as, as a community. Most of us come from an activist background, uh, if you really look at our history and, and where we are. And, and we've been fighting in our community for our, our, for our community and then went into politics because that's where all change is made. But if you look at, at most of our, our beginnings, and I know for myself, whether it was a Chicano movement where we went and had a, a protest, an anti-war protest, uh, against the Vietnam War. At that time, all of the front lines were made up of Chicanos. They were dying left <clears> and right in the Vietnam War. And we protested that war as, as any other protest, and it became, with, you know, the sheriffs turned it into a riot. We certainly did it. And that, that, that anger that we had at that time just spurred the Chicano movement and a lot of the issues forward. I know also for myself, I had an opportunity to work in the Carter White House and I remember being there and thinking that, you know, here we are, this place, this great place in Congress and the White House, when you can make all the changes, whether it be in bilingual education or college opportunity and things of that sort, they didn't know who we were. We were non-existent. And I remember one of the times that I was there, the first time I ever got gas was in the White House. I were there for the Shah and the Sharina of, of Iran. And, uh, they're holding our little flags as what all the White House used to be sent out onto the lawn to, to play a prop, you know, for, uh, for those things. And I just remembered stepping out that evening and they said, oh no, we have to walk all Persians to their car. And I said, I'm not Persian, it's <laughs> Mexican. <laughs> and they said, oh, are you from Mexico? And I said, no, no, I'm from East LA. And they're going, we're going to walk all the Persians anyway. <laughs> as far as our issues, and when anybody would talk to us, I mean, all the issues were important to us, but they always wanted to know how we, what was our position on bilingual education and so on. And then even, even again, when I was interested and involved in politics, so every time we've been discriminated, I think it moves us and, and prompts us to be more assertive, more aggressive, and to fight for, for our rights. I mean, one of the reasons as well is that, you know, and these guys know that when there were the two seats, 
is that because of the work that Richard had done on reapportionment and the, the, the census that we did way back in the 1980s and showed we were a significant number, that we had an opportunity of, of getting into the, the two congressional seats that came to Southern California, we thought there should be a, a Chicano and a Chicana that should run for these seats. Um, the powers that be at that time didn't think they, that two guys should run for those seats. But that really spurred us as women that said, we've got to get Chicanas elected, other guy, otherwise we're never going to be part of, of the, this, the important um, house of, of I mean, where all change is made in the U.S. Congress, in the state legislatures, on the city council, the board of supervisors. It, and even if you look at 187, uh, Proposition 187 passed in California. And because of that, my own mother realized, even though she was, you know, in, in um, what is it? What, uh, she was a doc. She was documented. She wasn't yet legal a citizen, and she said, "Oh, never, yeah, a, a legal resident." But she decided to become a citizen and wanted to protect her rights as well. And and we saw that over and over. Our voter registration numbers went up. So I think part of our resilience is when we are facing these kinds of obstacles. There are many of us who have, have been fortunate to have the opportunity to stand up, be assertive, be aggressive, but to take on and correct these kinds of wrongs. So that's part of our resilience as a community. Uh, and so I think that's an important part in that, all of our background, if you look at us. We're, we all come from an activist background, always trying to make change, and in the forefront of, of some of these very, very significant issues, because we need to be there, and we need to continue to be there. There must have been a time, George, when people felt invisible, despite feeling active and ready to get active, and as, as Gloria is describing. How did it change when people became more visible, when more people got elected to office? How did that change? You were in and around a lot of the elected officials at that time. If it's okay with you, Ray, if I'd like to defer that to Mike. Okay, he's got something else to say. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Richard, thank you for joining us. We've already introduced you. You already got a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> to be precise, that's actually your third round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't even said anything. Um, we did indicate, though, that you played a tremendous role in increasing the representation of Latino elected officials in Sacramento and D.C. and other places. And Gloria describes a time of feeling to be heard was a tremendous challenge. How did you see it change as more people got into office? I think it was important um, time to ensure that our community's experience of men, women, and lesbian um, and people of color uh, had a seat at the table uh, when I, I had the opportunity and the privilege to, the honor of serving as the Latino caucus chair for 12 years, and that gave uh, enough time to build a strategic plan uh, with very intent uh, in identifying and recruiting Latino Latinas in non-minority districts, which was different and unique. We didn't subscribe to the notion that because you're minority, you can only run and win in minority districts. And so um, <clears throat> it was a, a very strategic uh, plan. Uh, I'm proud of my involvement in recruiting Latinas uh, and supporting them. It's one thing to, to endorse and lend your name. It's another to uh, go and beyond that, raising the money, giving them the financial capacity, uh, <clears throat> so the, the, and the reason for that is because, as I said in, in previous presentations, uh, our community's experience matters. The public policy that had been conducted, debated, had been in a vacuum uh, for a long period of time, and so we were not present uh, when, uh, when we were given assignments to committees. They were historically uh, very traditional not to they were not the budget committee, the appropriations committee. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> what develops is, is the opportunity to build cr critical mass among uh, individuals who ex experience is very much aligned with one another. And in doing so, we were able to put together the strategy and elect Cruz Bustamante, the first speaker of the assembly. And why was that important? It was important because, again, through my friends here, and the, 
I'm going to repeat myself. It's, it was important because the speakership sets the agenda for the next two years. And uh, the university uh, at, uh, up north uh, would not have been built without the strong leadership of Cruz. Children of undocumented would not have had health care but for Ricardo Nara. And I can go on and on and on. And so, but for their advocacy, their experience, their knowledge, they were able to articulate much along the lines of, of Gill with, with the bill uh, that provides licenses uh, for undocumented. Very, very helpful. I wonder a little bit how government changed when more Latinas were in office in addition to a greater representation for Latinos. When you're the only one in a governing body, and as Richard was the only Latino in the city council for quite a while, oh, not for quite a while because you came in, but then you got another job. Right. Um, uh, but you were in the supervisors, and, and you're often, it's as if you have to speak for the whole community. But with more and more people coming in, there was a greater representation of women. Did they change the style of representation and the approach of the community <laughs> in the legislature, the city council, in a place that was visible? Well, I think that now when you look at the issues, you look at the issue like what, what Gil was fighting as far as the driver's license bill, or the issues today of, uh, you know, the issues of immigration, the dialogue is changing dramatically. Why? Because we're at the table. We hadn't been there before. I mean, when Congressman Royval was the only Mexicano in, in the U.S. Congress, I mean, that spoke volumes about why those issues were not discussed. But now we are, we are, we've been a part of it. We are moving forward. So now there's a different kind of dialogue going on. But when you're the only one, or a very few, and you're always looked upon as that minority, and that minority's issues are not as important. And so consequently, as, as we grow in mass, of course, it's much easier. It's a shortcut. Um, when, when you have that same kind of background and culture and you come from that same community, those issues um, are, of course, very easy to articulate and advocate. And then you have colleagues that are there as well, and you can create the critical mass that's necessary to move some of those issues. So you're seeing a very, very different. I mean, California has, has become, I mean, it was a, I can't say it was a red state, but it was a Republican state for the longest time. But now with the Latino vote here, we've become a very strong blue state. And, and I think that, that our presence and our participation has been that reason and that rationale. But a lot of the times, again, it is a shortcut to get many of our issues done and carried out. We still have a long ways to go. Uh, we're not getting everything we need to do, and we're still, we're still a minority when it comes to our elected officials. Uh, but the reality is um, each of us who, who come to the table come with strong voices, a very significant agenda, a very uh, a responsibility to a community, and I think we take and honor that responsibility, and, and so we fight a little harder, it may be a little louder than most. Let me just quickly address the audience, which is if anybody has questions they would like to address to our distinguished panel, could you raise your hands if you're collecting cards? Please uh, fill out cards and pass those over. Do you ever have the feeling after all the things you've accomplished as tremendously for people, I, I think what each of you has accomplished in your careers, if there's something you wish you could do now to get accomplished, if you were if you were back in office, I mean we have you know a current office over here, of course, but is there a dream you have that you would like to see accomplished for the community that would be the next level that maybe the young people in the audience could really throw themselves into Richard? Well, I'd like to see a governor of the state of California, whether it be male or female. I mean, I'd like to see it happen. I believe that it is going to happen. I think that we've learned a lot about the political process and what it takes, uh, how you advance uh, and work together to on a, an issue of mutual interest, uh, but the only way it's going to happen is that, you know, we have to know and not argue whether that person is Mexican enough or that person is liberal enough. I mean, to me, nothing is given. It's unfortunately you have to go after it and, and take it. And uh, to get 
caught up in issues that we've been fighting for many times together, separately and everything else for a long period of time. And you continue because we have a difference and we don't come together uh, in large enough numbers. That's a sad commentary because we end up losing in the long run more than we gain. Now I think that you look at what happened after 187. You know, I just remember the day I I had I used to go to this panaderia right here on Ford Boulevard and uh, I remember walking in and this lady and this man that had worked in this panaderia for a long time, the lady comes up to me and, he's, and she shows me her voter card that she had voted. And she made it clear. I mean, I, kept, I, I worked for this day and in very colorful language. <laughs> that even embarrassed me. I'm getting really embarrassed, I suppose. But she looks at me and she just came out with what I mean, I'll never forget what she said. And you know, she got it, <coughs> so did a lot of other people get it. And when we allow a person that happens to be a, the highest elected official to say and do the things that, that he doesn't get away with it, and to do it in the strongest of racial or overtones, I mean, it's, it's, it's just incredible to me. And, um, we have to fight even that much more. I think we'll see it, but, you know, if we want it bad enough, then we have to minimize the time it's going to take us to get there and get others involved. Joe, were you going to add something? Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate your question, uh, particularly the question on, on visibility and invisibility, right? I, I, I still have a sense for all the great progress we made of being feeling invisible in many respects to public policy. And, and, and I want to raise this point is, is for example, the image as, as Richard has indicated. So the president begins his campaign by attacking us. First of all, that's pretty audacious. You must, you're, you're not going to attack somebody who's going to over you or that you respect or that you think has the power to defend themselves, you attack somebody that you think that you, a bully attacks somebody that they think that they can bully. So we're not flattered that we're attacked by the president in his speech to become the president of this country. Proud of our efforts, of our resistance and the long history and the, the cases laid out in the book. But, but it's also offensive. And then the second point is, much of this for me, Thinking back, where could we do more? You know, the, the image that exists of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, uh, Latinos, Latinas in this, in this city, state, country, a lot of it's driven by Hollywood. And if you look at Hollywood and you look at the images, we're narco-traffickers, we're landscapers, we're uh, uh, women, maids. women of ill repute, maids and prostitutes, and maids and maids. That's who we are. I would, I would hope that we could do something to help change that. That's 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 an area where I think we need to do more. And clearly, when you look at the Academy Awards in the last six years, five of the last six winners, directors have been Mexican. So we know how to make movies. That's not a question. But on this side of the border, the challenge is opportunity. And that opportunity doesn't exist for us to make movies, to write books, to make documentaries that reflect who we are as a community. The family stories of everybody up here are rich and deep, but we never see that. And so for me, I, 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 have a, I, I do have that sense of us not being visible uh, enough. If you look at the literature, uh, let's talk about Barack Obama and his campaigns, and the literature written about him, were not mentioned at all. 
It was shocking. It's like we had no role in the campaign. It's like our issues had no role. I'm happy today that at least the questions of immigration are, are front and forward on the debate, that the question of DACA has to be addressed, that the question of immigration reform will be addressed. But we have to continually fight for that. And then we're all, there's other issues. All of us here have our policy areas of interest where those matters should be also addressed. And I think that, the, just to add to that, I really think it's important to say that while, again, I guess we're pioneers in this whole area, and that, that's what the book talks about, we created that opportunity and that opening, but it, it'll mean nothing if it doesn't continue with young people. If they don't continue to understand, we're still discriminated against. Our educational attainment is still the lowest. I mean, the issue that, that Gil raised about uh, uh, Hollywood, today in this country, one in four tickets uh, that are sold to a movie house are Latino, are buying those tickets. And yet we are not getting that kind of opportunity to be in front of the camera or behind the camera. And what that says is we are non-existent in a place where children are watching and they don't see those images up there about being judges and lawyers or Supreme Court justice mm -hmm. or an elected official. And, and that has an implication on, on our society as well. And so I hope that young people realize that we may have been uh, the ones that started, but we really need to empower and, and, and get young people to realize that the fight is not over, it's just begun. It is amazing to me that yet we just had a, a, one of the most important issues on our agenda is education. We had a, a school board yep. election in, yep. in, in the, one of the most Latino districts two non-Latinas are running for the runoff and for that seat. That's disgraceful. In, in, in areas of all the southeast cities, the east side, uh, it's amazing to me. And we should be pissed off about it. And when we're pissed off, don't just say grumble about it, but do something about it. It's got to change. So I'm happy to spend my last 45 years and, and hey, I'm ready to move on. But it isn't going to be effective and it isn't all the work that we did is just not going to be effective if we don't have young people recognizing and the importance of picking up where we've left off and move forward because we still have many many things that we need to achieve uh, and we should be proud of what we accomplished but we really have to recognize that and we've got so much more to do. Let me just add on to that. You know this book is to me a very important book that what it's about and the people that are involved in it and, and the like. I remember my two years in teaching at the university and, you know, it was difficult to find books that were written by our own. And how can you teach if you can't even get books into the classroom so that people know uh, richness of our culture, the richness of our contribution to this country, to this state, to this city, to this county. And, you know, you're seeing more and more. And we need to go a long way. Because I think that once that our story is communicated by us to our young and to our communities and the like, classes here at, here at the university, uh, the more uh, that people are going to see uh, that we have a rich history and a rich culture uh, that has to be uh, better uh, shown and better presented uh, than the things that we have seen in the past. Richard, what's, oh, sorry, I was just going to add, because one of the things that Richard raised is, you know, where we come from in our culture is very important to take into our leadership as well. We do not need to become them. We, we need to bring ourselves and our culture and what our, we're, we're our family. We, we, everybody's a comadre and a compadre in our community, <laughs> and, and we're very inclusive, and I think that that's the kind of leadership that we should have in this country. So we shouldn't shy away from being who we are and where we come from and to continue that, that richness of what, what we have as a culture and bring it forward instead of trying to, to, to pull back on it. Uh, we should be proud of who we are and who we represent and the things that we need to get done.
And one thing I have to say about this panel, I hope you've all figured out, they're not out of the game. Uh, they're still in the middle of this. And I think they're, no matter what people say about, you know, maybe not in office, you know, they're in the game. And that's a challenge, I think, to everybody else. They're not, they're not stopping. So what's, what's, your, what's your dream about what could be done next? I think the, <clears throat> the issue that, uh, that Gilbert Councilman uh, raises with regards to the, me the, the movie industry, the stereotypes, something has to happen there. Um, growing up, it was, you know, blonde, blue eyes, white, and, and, and very much so still today. Uh, I have a tendency to look at magazines, and when I do, uh, I immediately go through the 10 first pages, how many Latinos, how many African Americans, and you can count them, you know, in one hand. So, that's a, that, had I paid more attention in the political process <clears throat> to the tax credits that they come and, 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 and ask for and other kinds of considerations, uh, should have looked at that with more accountability. Uh, and performance-based outcomes that they would have to uh, adhere to. Uh, the other is the, the issue of economic inequality that exists in, in, in communities of color. Uh, at, at what point in time does one individual uh, have, uh, who has or may have 12 dealerships of whatever kind of brand, uh, does it tap out? Why are we not expanding that with mentor, mentorship programs? Uh, from within, uh, identifying uh, the communities of color. We're the market base. We're the consumer base. Why, why, are, why, are, why is there not that kind of economic frontier? Um, and so, uh, but from a legislative per per perspective, those, those were two areas I think that uh, I wish I could have paid more attention to. However, even having said that, sometimes it's not done legislatively. I apologize for being late. I, I had committed to being at a press conference with El Centro del Pueblo. El Centro del, here's another example of, 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 of how our community is taken for granted. They, the city uh, council representative, wants to take away a, an existing playground, re, uh, taking a community asset that's used beyond recreation. Uh, it's used for therapy. Uh, and the original intent is for homeless housing. Well, everyone's is for homeless housing. However, that is no longer the intent. And and the advancement of the El Centro is saying, look, if we're going to build housing, it must be low-income housing, not just affordable housing, but low-income housing. And if you want to build it on a parking lot, let's build it on uh, the, the, next door. the next door, across the street. And 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 so. My point in raising it is that why is our, where else would that have occurred? Where else would they take it, an existing playground of a nonprofit community agency that has 30 to plus years giving service and now create this as, as, as uh, uh, an issue? Uh, so my point is at times it needs community action. It's not always fixed. And so the, 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 the issue of the TV and, and holding somebody accountable, wouldn't it be great to target one particular movie and make it an example, a message that enough, and not go there, and not spend the four you know, transactions that our community does. So it, it, it's not always within the legislative regulatory there's always a lot more that can get done, I believe, with the community's engagement. You know, public life can be hard for people. I mean, the swing of the arrows, um, and it's all in public. Uh, you win, you lose, uh, people say things, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. So for young people who are thinking, what, what personal skills do they need to withstand the rigors of political life? Maybe. You never know until you go in to see, but, but what would you say to, to a young person coming up? I think it's a wonderful life. The question is, how do you learn the strength to get through? 
Well, I think you have to have a thick skin, there's no doubt. <laughs> um, and it's tough. Running for office, you, you just got to be prepared to win, you got to prepare to lose. And, and both are tough. Uh, and certainly once you win, you have to prepare to lead and, and, and be substantive. But I know that for myself and for each of us who were some of the first ones there, is that we, we are the example and people are looking to us to provide that kind of leadership role and what kind of an individual we are in the work that we do because that, that makes a decision about whether they're gonna elect more of us or people like us. But I do think that, that um, it, it's a tough world and for a woman it's a tough world as well. Um, I'm glad I did it and I, I don't really necessarily want my daughter to do it, uh, <laughs> but it, I'm glad she's in, in another profession. But I really want to encourage, there's women who just have that passion and today there are many women uh, in the legislature and serving on councils and, and that are just unbelievable and, and that just doesn't get to them and I'm so glad. I mean, I don't see them crying and, and in, you know, at a press conference or anything like that. They take on issues, they take on leadership, they're moving forward, and that's true of all of us. And um, and just even on this issue of the playground, I mean, um, what is her name? She's who's leading the fight. Sandra Figueroa. Sandra Figueroa. She's up against the mayor and the city council, and she is fighting, and she's been fighting for that community forever. So in whatever role you're in, I mean, you're eventually involved in politics, but you do develop, develop a school. And I think what motivates us is the issues, it, 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 and, and, and championing those issues, and having the community behind us, and, and making those changes. They're incremental, they're small, but they're, they're significant, and they're important, and they're important to us, and that keeps us moving all of the time. Well, this really helps, because this was the first question that was just handed to me from our Audience. So I just guessed that that was going to be the first question. So you're, you're actually answering an audience question. Oh, okay. Well, let me uh, applaud uh, if I could call them my colleagues here on stage because they have been champions, and it's a it's a brutal life, public service. Uh, elected office is a brutal life. It's it's people are harsh, unkind, and disrespectful, and that's you know that's. That's yeah, the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you're scrolling the, the alley down to the morning. <laughs> and so the people up here have been, you know, great examples of that. I think one of the things is, is you have to, as, as the supervisor says, you have to have this commitment to service. Uh, and then you have to have that resiliency that we learn from our families. Uh, context is always uh, an important part. I mean, as, Difficult as it is, we've all had, I'll say for myself, very rich lives. Rich in the experiences that we've had, rich in the, in the depth of the relationships, rich in terms of the substance of, of what we get up every day and are able to have an influence in, in our lives and the lives of so many people. Uh, and so I'm, I'm proud to be part of the book. Uh, but there are some, some experiences we had that I think are just extraordinary. Our efforts around the healthcare system in 96, I mean, people underestimate that there would not be a health care system in the county of Los Angeles were not for the supervisor's leadership, the work in collaborating with the union. It was an historic, monumental senator. Uh, uh, Polanco at the time was taking me under his tutelage. The councilman was there. I mean, the four of us, all of us here on the stage were involved in that, and it was very significant. People don't understand. We would not have a health care system in this region were it not for the kind of collaborative efforts of all of us. So. Slings and arrows. Slings and arrows. <laughs> yeah. to, to the question, if I may, um, know that your life is an open book and that there are no secrets. Be prepared for that. We all make mistakes. Own them. Take responsibility for them. But don't let the circumstances dictate what you're going to do, what needs to be done. And don't be afraid to engage in this process. It is, for me, it was one of the most rewarding <clears throat> process uh, ever. It was my dream to be an elected official, very early in age. And with everything that I uh, did and uh, worked towards was uh, to be of service, to be of service uh, to others 
And, uh, but don't let fear overtake you. Dream big. Fear not. Don't let that conquer wherever your career is going to be. Uh, yes, it is a difficult uh, time constraint. You balance Sacramento with your family life, and uh, it, it can become difficult at times. But uh, every day, every vote, every setback, every success was measurable in this legislative process, which I think is probably the greatest legislative process in the country, if not in the world. The fact that you have a committee process and people can come and articulate it and uh, have their voices heard uh, is, is, is really true democracy. Richard, slings and arrows. Well, <laughs> I've got a little experience in that. Uh, no, it's a brutal, but uh, you know, kind of, you know, I think about, you know, just in listening to, to Gloria, and listening to Gil, and listening to Richard, takes me back in time. There's nothing I love more than a good fight. <laughs> Seriously. You know, I, I think of some of the things that I was able to accomplish. Some people thought I was a miracle worker, and all it was is you know, it was common sense most of the time. Um, I remember, and I'll just give one example, the University of California at Berkeley, the law school, one of the most prestigious law schools, or as both law school, uh, in part of the UC system. It was a problem that came up at my, at that time, my brother Willie Brown brought some attention to me about the situation that took place against one of the most noteworthy individuals in the newspaper business at, uh, in uh, Oakland. And it had to do with access, access to the institution. So early on, I uh, told me what the problem was, and I had an experience that worked very well. So uh, the budget came along, and I sat on the chairman of the subcommittee that had to do with all of the money that the University of California received from the state of California. So I brought in the chancellor for uh, the law school. And he ended up being a Supreme Court justice and the like. And uh, I explained to him a problem that I, many legislators were having with the university and the like. And of course, he began to give me a long speech about, uh, you know, this is a very prestigious school and that this is one of the premier law schools and the like. And I said, well, you know, I really believe that you have to open up the opportunity for uh, people other than those that are in the law school now to the ones that are trying to get into the law schools. And he didn't see much validity to my argument and everything else. So I said, okay. So when the budget came out, we had funded the the university and the law school and defunded the administration. <laughs> Seemed to me a very logical. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't the professors who were causing the problem, but it was the chancellor or the president of the thing. And, you know, a day later, two days later, he comes into my office and says, you know, this is horrible. And I said, yeah, and I, I agree. I really hate to do it. He said, but if you think that, uh, you know, because you're coming here and I know where you're going next, 
you think that it's going to change my opinion, being that it's here and I have the control over this issue, you have a long way, in, you have a long way to go. Three years after that, we were invited by students. I can imagine. We even, uh, Willie Brown was invited to give the keynote speech at the at Walt Law School graduation. And then I was there to just say a few words. And, you know, we got everything we wanted. Once that they figured out that it wasn't going to change. And I used that on many other occasions at universities that believe more in institutions for themselves and not the people that were supposed to be educating. And simple and the like, never missed, you know. And not to say that all universities are that way, but those that couldn't, didn't want to do it the easy way, then we showed them how to do it the hard way. <laughs> all for a constructive purpose, because the majority of that class, some of them, one of them was a compadre of mine that uh, ended up being the chairman for the graduation ceremonies. Definitely never going to have, never would have another one like him after that. I don't think they ever had one like that. And, uh, but yet, these were, it was the example of what can happen if you strive to improve the representation at the law school. And it goes for medical schools and, and the like. And I, I love this institution here. And the reason why I love this institution is I think about when I was here, and I just remember coming here at a meeting with the president about an issue here, and just to walk this campus. Truly, Cal State LA was the university that opened its doors before a lot of institutions, and to see the representation now, and the fact that we're graduating people of color, women, you know, you could name it, across the board, uh, you know, it makes the work that I did and the crap that I had to put up with uh, just a lot easier. And for those of you that are students, you know, you can do anything that you want. And if you want to get into the political arena, you got some people here that are experts at helping you along. And you know, I take great pride of where I graduated from and where the institution sits. So, thank you. Uh, time for one more question from the audience, and then we're going to close with George Claw. Uh, uh, this is from the audience. I'm Asian and I feel invisible all the time. As a minority, how can we work together with other minority groups to drive the important issues facing all of us? Maybe that's a good place to conclude our conversation. So if anybody has any thought about coalitions and alliances and where it's, that may be going in the last few years. It weeks, started a long time, started a while back, and I think it's even that much more important today. Yeah. And. Uh, there's people that are involved. Polanco did a lot of work in that area when he was uh, in the state legislature, whether it was the assembly or the Senate. And I think it goes on. And if you have any questions, we're around and we'll be more than glad to try and steer you in the right direction. I think the key for our community is coalition building, and I think that one of the things that I, at least in the leadership roles and, and trying to um, to talk to more women about our leadership responsibility to a community, is that, and again, I bring back that our culture is very inclusive, and when we, when we look at our numbers, we are the future leaders of this country, 
And when you look at who we are and what we're about, we are very, very inclusive. And so I always see ourselves as well serving in those roles, but also being, I guess, bringing everybody along with us, empowering communities. And so um, when you look at us and, and the work we've done, I have, have been blessed to be part of a coalition, I think, that got me elected. Um, I mean, one of the things when I was running for office and, and being, there wasn't a whole lot of money in our community as far as, as supporting a Chicana running for office, but I had been a part of a coalition with other women across the state that were trying to get women elected to the legislature and the U.S. Congress, and it was made up of, of you know, Anglo women and black women and Asian women and all of us collectively were always supportive of each other. And we've continued to to, uh, to support those kinds of efforts. And I think that's true of all of the work. I mean, Richard talks about his coalition with Willie Brown and the power that they had together and the kind of change that they made. And I think all of us have always been building on coalitions that haven't looked at themselves exclusively uh, as just Chicano leaders. When we served in these roles, when we talked about policy, it was in policy that was good for the rest of the community. Even Gil talks about the driver's licensing. I mean, this thing that they were denying undocumented people a driver's license, they were still driving. Wouldn't they be better <laughs> off if they were had a license and knew the rules and, and, and you know all the laws of the state? So when we legislate, we legislate for everyone. So, you know, being whether you're Asian or African African American, is it I think our leadership responsibility and duty as a community is a collective one. And, and and if you look at our backgrounds, we all come from that collaborative kind of model and we pursue those collaborative models when we legislate as well. Richard, do you want to comment? I, I will just say the following. In terms of, of the model we created with the Latino Caucus, uh, I was approached by uh, the Asian uh, Pacific Islanders. Uh, today, that, that that model is used both by the uh, African American uh, Legislative Caucus, the API. Uh, I think there are probably now in the legislature the number, if I'm not mistaken, more Asians than African Americans holding office in Sacramento, and so. It's just a matter of engaging whoever posed the question. Coalition building is, is the right frontier. It's, it's where the future is. Um, once you get there, I always say, look, you have an added responsibility, and I would say to myself, a duty to address those special needs that exist in our community, just like there are special needs that exist in the Asian, African American and the other communities, we cannot shy away from advocating and addressing those particular issues at the expense of any other issue, whomever, whatever the coalition may be. Uh, I, I firmly believe that uh, we are best to articulate our experience and uh, because we lived it, and uh, that applies to uh, the other members of communities of color. I think this is a great place to end our conversation, and I'm going to turn it over to George Plow, but before I do that, I just want to thank you so much for your frankness, for your the, the life that you brought to the table, and I wish I had like hours to sit and talk with you and just listen to you, but instead I'm going to turn it over to George Plow for closing comments. I've never been so quiet for so long. <laughs> We've discussed some uh, very serious topics, and I'd like to uh, lighten the mood a little bit by telling you that I'm uh, very excited to be here at Cal State LA. It's a very special place for me. Uh, I wore my Cal State colors. <laughs> I thought about uh, wearing a gold suit with a black tie, <laughs> but I thought that might be uh, a little much. When I was at uh, East LA College, I would uh, drive around Cal State LA and hope and pray that one day I could come to this university. It's a special place. Um, like many of you still here today, uh, first generation, first one to graduate in the family. 2019, it's, it's no different. Uh, back then, we were not the Golden Eagles, we were the Diablos. <laughs> And I want you to know that Diablo is very fitting of Richard L. Torque. 
All of you need to relax because he gave me permission to say that. <laughs> In the 70s, the state schools had football teams, and I'm very proud to have played here at Kent State. And I want to tell you that I was so good, or so bad, they canceled football when I finished playing. <laughs> so, to uh, my friend, President Covino, um, he does an incredible job for the students and the community that we serve. President Covino, I share your vision, and I'm proud to be part of it. How did you like the uh, job that our commentator made our moderator? <laughs> He is a beacon of knowledge, but there's something he doesn't know, which might shock you that you don't know something. <laughs> but I want you to know that you don't know that the book you wrote called Black and White, which was about coalition building, about how Tom Bradley got elected, inspired me to write Power Shift. <laughs> Now, about the book, David and I, uh, nine years ago, talked about writing this book and why, and uh, it occurred to us, and much has been covered in discussion by our, our esteemed lawyers here, that there are 60 million Latinos in the United States, and there's 15 million Latinos in California. And yet, as uh, Gloria has pointed out, uh, in 2019, we remain invisible or marginalized, stereotyped, and even demonized by some character in DC who should spend less time on Twitter and more time reading his history books. It occurred to David and I that young people don't know who these warriors are. They don't know the contributions they've made to our society. When students are asked to do a book report, they write about George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Dr. King, maybe, maybe Cesar Chavez. So to you students that are here today, are you aware that Congressman Roy Ball forced the Census Bureau to create a category called Hispanic that led to representation and programs in our community? Are you aware that Esteban Torres, were it not for him, that uh, North America Free Trade Agreement, Canada, Mexico, US, would have never been approved, and that Esteban Torres, tattoos and all, coming out of East LA, working at an auto plant, rose to become a United States ambassador. Senator Torres and his friend Ted Kennedy actually pioneered the Affordable Care Act, as you know today. Maria Elena Durazo, Miguel Contreras, changed the face of labor forevermore. And Antonio will tell you he would have never been elected mayor were it not for Maria Elena and Miguel Contreras. And Antonio, who would be here but he's out of the country, dared to take on the education establishment that was just fa failing our kids. 50% dropout rates, unforgivable. And the trans transportation system you see in the region were put forward by the courage and vision that uh, Antonio had as mayor. And then the individuals that are here today, and I'd like to uh, ask you to indulge me as I talk about you, if you would please stand and remain standing. Richard Alatori, please stand. <laughs> he has trouble following directions. <laughs> A lot has been said about the redistricting that he did in California, but what has not been said is how that was done. See, the traditional way is to draw lines, protect incumbents, and that's the job of a chairman of reapportionment. What Richard did 
is he took reapportionment out of Sacramento, brought it to Caltech, computerized the entire state, never been done before, and projected district boundaries looking forward 25 years. Had he not done that, you would not have representatives in Imperial County, San Bernardino, Central Valley. And David talked about, and uh, Rave talked about the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. It's true that Jerry Brown signed the legislation, but he would have had nothing to sign if Richard didn't work with Cesar Chavez to give bargaining rights to farm workers, people who didn't have a vote or a voice or money to contribute. And Richard and the legislature found out that in the state prisons, they were sterilizing people, men of color, put a stop to it. Gloria Molina, yes, please stand. <laughs> yes, it's truly the first, the first, the first. Very proud of that. But what you don't know is that USC Medical Center, known as General Hospital to some of you, was expanded in services to our community because of her leadership at the County Board of Supervisors. Some of you don't know that she single-handedly stood in front against the governor, against the legislature, to stop uh, prison from being uh, built in East Los Angeles. And that's the plan she had. And as a member of the Board of Supervisors, the most conservative body in America, she single-handedly transformed the dynamics of that, uh, that body. Richard Polanco. Ah, one that followed direction. <laughs> Richard Polanco, yes, we know about his leadership in creating the Latino Caucus, taking members from 6 to 26 affecting policy, affecting representation all over the state, prove that Latinos could win in non-Latino seats, something that uh, was unheard of. But beyond that, he was the first elected official to hold a public hearing on AIDS in the entire United States. Wow. And chair, authored the Voting Rights Act, which is still an issue in this country, the Voting Rights Act in California, Richard Polanco. Gilbert Cedillo. We know about the driver, driver's licensing bill. It's been covered well. But the DREAM Act. Do you see photos and articles about a whole bunch of people taking credit and signings and such on the Dream Act, bunch of baloney. <laughs> El Cedillo led the fight successfully for the Dreamers to have the opportunity to be in college and stay in college. That's Gilbert Cedillo. <laughs> I want you to remain standing because I want your students to take a good look at them. They're going to be available for photos and book signing. They impacted policy programs that had national implications for our entire society. Thank you. <laughs> I want to make something very clear. Partnership is not about one group over another. The intent of this book is to bring this growing segment of our society where it belongs, front and center, like Jewish American community, like the Italian American community, like the Irish American community. It's time to bring this to the forefront, and that's the intent that David and I had uh, when we put this book together. Finally, I'd like to uh, leave you with a quote from uh, my friend Leon Panetta, who wrote the foreword to this book. And I quote, this book shows that the American dream is not a gift. 
It is a struggle. Powership presents the journey of 10 warriors who gave people the chance to live the American dream. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, it's been a wonderfully informative night for all of us. Our program has ended. We'd like you to exit to the courtyard for a reception where books will be available for signing. Is that correct? And uh, I hope that our elected, our official past and present will be able to stay for a while to mingle. So those of you who put in questions we didn't get to, you might be able to get them answered. And once again, thank you all for coming this evening.